I'm going to put this on my hand now, and I'm going to refer to this. Do you know what this is? Do you know what this is? It's like when you go to Costco. Why would you even laugh at the mention of Costco? <laughs> when we get to heaven, it's going to say heaven, and then just buy on that, it's going to say Costco. So they, they, they count you when you come in. This is how people count things, and uh, I'm going to share the reason. Now I have to reset it because I just hit it a couple times. I'll share in my message. But I want to tell you this. We're, we're starting this, this series on Christmas Playlist. I've already got the song picked out for next Sunday. But if you have some suggestions, I haven't written the messages yet for the second or third or the fourth week. I'm open to some, to some suggestions, and if your suggestions are better than the things I'm thinking about, you can expect to hear your song. If they fall short of my expectations, I will mock you to your face. Now, please tell me if you want to, if, you, if you're thinking about a particular Christmas song, and it, and it can be biblically based or uh, just a modern-day classic or something that's become a modern-day classic, just let me know, and uh, I'll start thinking about it and praying about it. I do have next week. It's going to surprise you. It surprised me as I started thinking about it and was digging into some information. So that's going to be a lot of fun. So I've called this message today, Stuffed. It's a perfect title for a sermon immediately after Thanksgiving. In my opinion, that if there's any day in the calendar year where you can throw all caution to the wind, that you can double down, triple down as many times as you want in terms of your calorie intake, if there's gonna be any day that you're gonna just say, you know what, I don't care if this piece of cake has 9,000 calories in it, make it a double, amen. It's gonna be on Thanksgiving Day, can I get a witness? And we, we, we go for it and we love it and it's a day that at the end of the day you can feel stuffed and sometimes you can feel stuffed because of the stuffing. Now, I grew up on the east coast of Canada, and in my portion or area of the country, we didn't necessarily call it stuffing, and I'm just going to see, I might be the only one in here, Darcy, I don't know if you called it this out west, but we called it dressing. Does anybody know that? Okay, all of you people, when, when the rapture happens, you're going first. <laughs> you're, on the first you're on the first train out of here. So that's pretty cool. I didn't know that, but... In, in my household, my dad was a firefighter, and do we have any firefighters here today? Any firefighters? Any firefighters? Oh, right there. Let's give this firefighter a hand. My dad, my dad was a firefighter for over 30 years, and on his shift, it wasn't uncommon that my dad cooked for his crew. So my dad, man, I'll tell you, too bad I didn't get any skills that my father had, because my father could cook, he could bake, he, could, he, he, he was mechanically inclined. He was handy. I tell you, I don't know, in the 70s growing up when I was just a teenager, how many people in our church asked my dad to come to finish their basements. He could do it all. He could sew. He could knit. He could make curtains. I mean, the guy, I tell you, I, and, and people say, well, that must be wonderful to have such a great dad. And you're probably a lot like him. Nope. That's why I'm in the ministry, amen. That's why I'm a preacher, can't do any of those things. What I'm good at is convincing other people to do those things with me and for me, hallelujah. <laughs> amen, but this, this is a picture of my father's dressing. On, on the left, it's uncooked. On the right, it's the finished product. And it's very unusual because there is a herb that you can only find in that part of Canada called summer savory. And even when I lived in Ontario, you might think, because I, we, couldn't get, we couldn't get it down here. And I thought, well, when we moved back to Ontario, and I pastored there for seven years, we couldn't get it at the grocery stores there. So my sister has kind of been our, she's been our, our mule, if you will. She sends me summer savory in the mail. It's like, well, what is that? It's summer savory, man. It's for my dad's dressing. And so we got some family traditions, but I've been thinking about stuffing, and I've been thinking about dressing, and about a week ago, I was reading in Romans chapter 15, and I was reading through this, and I thought, oh, that, that, there's, my, there's my first sermon back from not preaching for four weeks. And by the way, in 29 years of having been in full-time ministry, I have never gone four weeks 
without preaching on a Sunday. But we were in this celebration of our 100 year anniversary and it's been awesome. But man, I've got all these sermons. So today you're gonna get four sermons back to back to back. We're, I'm gonna let you out tomorrow night at midnight. So f- settle down and we're just gonna lock in for the long haul. But about a week ago I was reading this and this verse jumped out at me. I, was, I didn't go looking for it. I was reading Romans chapter 15 for a different reason But when I read this, I thought, there it is. So let me read it to you. My dear brothers and sisters, I'm fully convinced of your genuine spirituality. I know that each of you is stuffed full of God's goodness and that you're richly supplied with all kinds of revelation knowledge and that you are empowered to effectively instruct one another. Then as I was reading through this, and I have my handy-dandy laser pointer here, next screen, As I was reading through the Bible, next slide, there we go. Uh, Here's where I was reading it, and I wrote down stuffing, and then I wrote over here stuffed. What I didn't realize was that over a year ago when I was reading through this same portion up here, and you can't see it too well, but that actually says stuffing, and then this word beside it says thanksgiving. And I thought, isn't God good? God gave me this thought a year ago. I didn't use it. I'm back reading the book of Romans. I'm thinking, there it is. Have you ever noticed sometimes God sometimes will speak something to you in a season that it may not be the season that you're in, but it's for a season that's on the horizon, and yet he's good enough to already begin to share the future with you. Amen? So that's how this sermon came into being today. And I want to unpack this very, very quickly. There are four things that I see in this verse, in verse 14, that Paul kind of mentions either directly or indirectly. Number one, he says, I am fully convinced. So the first thing, the four things are being convincing, counterfeits, capacity, and conduit. He says, I'm fully convinced that you're the real deal. I'm fully convinced of your genuine spirituality. I'm fully convinced that that your behavior and your belief There's not a disconnect there. It's congruent. It lines up. You walk your talk. And I thought, how convincing is my walk? How convincing is your walk? And I don't know if it was St. Francis of Assisi, one of those writers from four or five centuries ago. He said, preach the gospel everywhere you go. Use words if necessary. And our lives ought to be lived in such a way that our actions are louder than words. That we don't have to convince someone that we're following Christ, that our lives are the proof positive, that our lives line up with the confessions that we've made, with the commitments that we've made. By the way, what what do you do when I take a drink of water? No, you don't. You say, hallelujah, you're gone. (laughs) Oh, that's good. Paul, you're late. You're gone too. (laughs) Amen. But Paul was so convinced. He's like, I'm I'm fully convinced. And as we head into Christmas, and it's the Christmas season, and we're going to be participating in celebration of Christmas and everything else, let's make sure that we behave in such a way that regardless if we lead somebody down the Romans road and we take them through those spiritual steps steps to get somebody saved that by our smiles, by our spirit, by our warmth and by our welcome of the world around us that our commitments become the very proof that we become literally illustrated sermons of the goodness of God. And Paul says, I'm convinced. I am convinced. I, I don't want anyone that knows me to say, you know what? I know this is what Todd confesses, and here's what he says that he's committed to, but I'm unconvinced because I see these inconsistencies. I see these compromises. I see these things that don't line up with what he's professing and what he's proclaiming. Let our lives, let our proclamation and the things that we profess be, be the proof that by our actions, that they're in sync with what God is doing. Amen? Amen. Number two, counterfeits. The reason why I put counterfeits here, because he says, I'm convinced of your genuine spirituality. Why would Paul say that? Because he encountered many people that were disingenuous, that were inauthentic, 
that they looked good from afar, but they were far from good. Jesus talked about this. He said, they, they worship me with their lips. It looks like they're all about it. They're there on the front row, and this is nothing against you guys on the front row, but, but they're there on the front row, and their hands are raised, and they're doing the Holy Ghost hop, and man, the next thing you know, I, I, I Jericho, Jericho March broke out. He's like, it looks like it, but I know their hearts, and their hearts are far from me. And let's make sure that whatever we're proclaiming, whatever we're professing, that at the end of the day, that it's genuine, that it's real to us. I know people that have memorized the Bible. I commit scriptures to, to memorization as well. But at the end of the day, you're not going to get little, a little badge for that. And I would much rather have somebody personalize the Word of God than just memorize the Word of God. Satan was able to take the Word of God. It was when Jesus was being tempted in the devil, in the, in the desert. He's like, well, didn't the word say that you jump off here? You're going to be good to go. His angels will bear you up. Listen, Satan knows the devil. Uh, Satan, Satan knows the devil. Satan knows the Bible. Just because somebody knows the Bible doesn't mean that their faith is legitimate in, in how they express that and how they live that out. And there can be counterfeits. I read the book years before the movie ever came out by Frank Abengale Jr., who was the subject of the movie with Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio of Catch Me If You Can. And the book is better than the movie. The movie, the movie comes close, but the, but, but the book is, is way more awesome. And here's this guy that became basically the best counterfeiter on so many different levels because not only did he become an expert in counterfeiting checks, but he would counterfeit people that were in legitimate uh, professions, and he, he, he was a counterfeit emergency room doctor. He was a counterfeit uh, assistant DA in the state of Louisiana. He was a counterfeit pilot. He, I mean, he, he, walk, he walked it, and it looked like he, he, he looked like he was walking his talk, but he, it was all fake. It was all a false construct, and it, he was a counterfeit that way. Number three, capacity. Paul goes on to say here, and we read it, he's like, I know that you are stuffed full. He said, you're, you're a 20-pound bag, and we're trying to put 22 pounds of God's goodness in you because it's stuffed full. Sadly, a lot of people have a capacity, and they're not full. And if you ever hope to get to overflow, certainly you've got to surpass being full. But a lot of people think, well, you know what? I'm just going to go. And I used to do this back in the day, man, when I, when I was really hurting for some bucks and, and, you know, and gas, and you're just a kid and everything else, and you go to the gas station, and you just like, fill it up. No, no, give me $3.12. And it just barely moves the needle. You, you fill it up a quarter of a tank, if that, and not now, <laughs> that's not, not even a gallon now, but back in the day, and it's like, I, I never filled it to capacity. I never, I never paid the price. There, there's a point to be made there. You want to be, if you want to be filled to the fullness, you're going to pay a price for that. Don't be content to say, just put in a quarter of a tank. Fill that tank all the way up. But there, you got to understand that you can increase your capacity. The Bible talks about in Romans chapter 12 that as we come into faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, we're given a measure of faith. But in no way does that suggest that the measure of faith that you start your journey with Jesus with should be the measure of faith that you end with. If we're talking on a vertical scale, as you come to faith and you're three feet high in terms of how tall you are in your faith, I would hope that by the end of your life on this earth, that you've graduated from being three feet to be walking among the giants. And you can increase your capacity, but you've got to have that desire for more. You've got to have that desire for improvement. Now, you may be wondering what this is up here today. Listen, my ultimate job would be to work at Costco. Hallelujah. So I'm, tra I'm in training. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I'm not. What I'm doing, and I'm not going to tell, I only had one person ask me. They were curious enough after the first service, and I'm not surprised this person ha is very intellectually curious. And, and so they, they cornered me, and they said, I think I've got it figured out. And they were right. But I've been public speaking for a long time now, not just as a preacher. I've been preaching full-time for 29 years, but prior to that, when I was in college, 
When I was 18, I took the Dale Carnegie public speaking course. I was the youngest person in my class, and then when I graduated that year at 19, I was invited back, and I became the youngest Dale Carnegie trainer in my province in New Brunswick, Canada, back in the 1980s, and here I had all of these professional corporate types in, in, in our audience, and here's this 19-year-old kid teaching these, these, these seasoned corporate people public speaking. So I've been public speaking for a long time. That said, I am not nearly satisfied with my development. And I desire to become more effective. I, I desire to be more fruitful. I desire to be more excellent. So I am self-policing myself in the name of self-improvement because I want to get better. And this is something that I am using personally. And I want to ask you today, is, is there an area in your life where God has gifted you and you're using it professionally, you're using it relationally, socially, whatever? But do you, do you desire to improve? Because a person that doesn't desire to improve, there's two things that happen. Number one, they're arrogant. And number two, they're arrested. Their, their development is arrested. They, are, they stopped learning. I heard this many, many, many years ago. I was attending, Renee and I were attending a pastor's conference and Pastor Bill Hybels from Willow Creek was leading the general session. And we were there with a number of our staff members from one of the churches that we were pastoring. And they had us do this exercise that you had to grade your church in these five different areas and we were kind of huddled up. You had to grade your church on small groups, on volunteering, on, on increase in terms of charitable giving because that was a metric for people increasing their faith. It wasn't about making your budget fuller or anything like that. It, 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 there was a number, that how many people were graduating to the point where they were in a leadership pipeline and they were kind of tapped on the shoulder and they were entrusted with even more and more responsibility and opportunity in the church. And I can't remember what our grade was. It was, let's just say, 7.6 out of 10. Not a bad score. There are people, other churches there that scored more highly, other churches scored more lowly, but that's not the point that Bill Hybels was trying to make. And this was very, very sobering. I've never forgotten it, and I think about this relentlessly. He said, okay, let's just say that the highest score in here today is 9.2. Way to go, guys. That is a phenomenal score. You're definitely doing something right. But what I want to know is, how are you closing the distance from 9.2 to 10? And if you can't tell me, you're not growing. And you can apply that to your life. You can apply that to your career. You can apply that to your walk with God. You can apply that to your relationship. Let's just say that on a marital scale, you score an 8.8. And she looks at you, and you look at him, and it, man, it's still, whoo, it, this is amazing. Way to go. Way to go for being still crazy in love. The question is, what are you doing to close the gap from 8.8 .8 to 10? How are you committing yourself to being a better spouse? And so capacity is something that we need to be considering. And Paul said here, I know that you are stuffed full. Way to go. For what reason? For what reason? The last point is conduit. He said, the reason why this has happened, you've got some revelation, you've got some knowledge. It's not to go around boasting or grandstanding or just kind of flexing your spiritual muscles. No. It is to, you are empowered to instruct others. And we got to recognize as God does stuff in us and through us, iron sharpens iron and you're to bring out the best in me and I'm to bring out the best in you and we're to bring out the best in one another and we're to use what God has given us to improve the people around us, to help them, to benefit them, to add value to their lives. Paul says in, in, in Philippians chapter one, he said, listen, I... I would rather go be with Jesus. I'm tired of these shipwrecks and these beatings and all of the stuff that I've gone through. But here's my conclusion. The only reason I'm staying here is because I love you so much and I know that if I'm staying here, it's to promote your progress. And we have to look at our lives, evaluate our lives against the backdrop, among other things, if we're gonna be stuffed full with God's goodness, it's not just enough to make us feel good, but it, it's for us to do good for the benefit of others. Can somebody say amen? amen. Stuffed by definition, it means to, uh, to fill by packing things in. And as Brooke comes back to the keyboard, can you believe it? I'm already through my four points. 
I got a fifth point here today. How many people, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a classic Tommy Barnett. How many people give me five more minutes? Five more minutes. Five more. Hold, keep your hand up. Five, 10, 15, 20, 25. I do that joke all the time, and it always gets a laugh. I don't get it. I don't know if you're laughing with me or at me. Amen. But here's the second thing that rattled my cage this week. And I've never heard anybody talk about this. This is what God kind of downloaded to me this week. I know there's sermons on it, and I know there's thoughts and truths around it. But to be stuffed, it means to close up so there are no empty spaces. And I just kind of felt God take me on this journey as I was contemplating this to identify sometimes the empty spaces that we have within our lives. And we all have them. The question is, are we stuffed so that we're filled to capacity? We're stuffed full of God's goodness so those empty spaces surely start to become eliminated and then eventually eradicated because it's not empty anymore. You're filled, you're stuffed with God's goodness. And I read an article, and I just want to just recapture. These are not my words. It was the writer of the article said, all people are creative and full of potential. Not all of them use this potential and thus feel as though they're wasting their time and energy. Most of them report feeling empty. We try to fill the void with food, relationships, work, and things that are supposed to distract our attention. The reason why we're looking for something or someone to distract us so we don't have to pay attention to the gnawing emptiness on the inside of us. And I'm talking to Christians that experience this as well. It's just not the people, once you have God to fill it. Listen, I know too many pastors. I know know, too, too many people. I've experienced in seasons of my life empty spaces on the inside of me as well. So I get it. An unfulfilling job, a lack, of the, uh, a lack of close relationships, a toxic re- relationship, or a simple lack of self-love and compassion are all the things that can cause emptiness. The most important thing is to realize that feeling empty is a state of lack. That person is lacking something in one or more areas. Many reasons can lead them to feeling empty. The, these reasons can be mental, physical, emotional, and spiritual. And as a result, this feeling of emptiness, this feeling can travel, listen to this, can travel through our lives like baggage. Yesterday, I, you know, I've been paying attention this year, and I'm one of millions across the nation that when Deion Sanders had made the move to the Colorado Buffaloes, and, you know, they won their first three games, and they were a national sensation, and then they won more game after that, but they finished up the year four and eight. They lost yesterday. He has two of his boys on there, two of his sons that are on the team, and I've watched Dion for a number of years, just not because he's prime time, but uh, he's been very bold in his faith. At one time, he was attending T.D. Jakes' church, and I've watched him at different times share his testimony. So I, I like the guy. You know, he's not everybody's cup of tea, but I, I like the guy. But as I was looking, because I wanted to know what was his locker room speech going to be yesterday when they finished up the year, the way that they kind of finished up the year. But another article popped up from many years ago, and this article was about when he attempted suicide. Now, this was not, he didn't attempt suicide when he was growing up and in, 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 in a challenging situation in the state of Florida before basically he, you know, he, he went to college and then he went into the NFL and then he won two, two Super Bowls and he's basically at his position that he played for 14 years considered the best. He, he's the Michael Jordan. He's the Deion Saunders in that particular, he, he, he's the guy in that area. So that, that, this is not prior to all of those things, and his family was broke, and he was, no, 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 this is, this is post the Super Bowl rings, post being named uh, the Hall of Famer, post being this winner in all of these different areas of, of accomplishment throughout his life, and it was at that point, he basically drives his car off a ditch, and he wants to die, and the article said, because I, I can't make this up, the article said, the reason I did that, I was empty. You wouldn't think of that guy dealing with empty spaces. In this verse, as I was thinking about it this week, being stuffed with God's goodness, stuff, the reason why God wants to stuff us with his goodness so that there's no empty spaces that remain. 
And I've known too many good men and too many good women and too many husbands and wives and mothers and fathers and the kids and, and the generations and things that didn't attend to the empty spaces on the inside. And they would look. Listen, I've done, and Renee and I've done, we've done some marital counseling where there's been a husband who's cheated on a wife or the wife has cheated on the husband. And the reason ultimately that provoked that, it wasn't just that they were tempted. The reason why they were tempted is because they were lacking something in the relationship, that spouse, and there was an emptiness inside and they tried to fill it with that adulterous affair. I've watched people just try to fill their lives up. And I'm talking about Christians. I'm not saying fill it up just with all of those bad things and those things that would classically be defined by adultery, what have you, but just trying to, because they haven't allowed the fullness of God's goodness to fill them up. We need to let God's goodness. It says in Matthew chapter 12, and I'm just going to read the last portion of this. This is from the Amplified. I'll read the first part. But when the unclean spirit has gone out from a man, it roams through the dry, arid places in search of rest, but it does not find any. Then it says, I'll go back to my house, which I, which I came out of. So this is about somebody, this is about a demon that's been dispossessed, and this person now has been basically set free and liberated from whatever had possessed him. But then the demon says, and when it arrives... And it finds the place unoccupied, swept, and put in place and decorated. So let's just stop right there. I don't want you to be thinking and chasing the point that this person was demon-possessed, and this has got nothing to do with me. The point I want to make is that when this demon comes back, it finds the house empty. The Amplified says unoccupied. Then it says that not only that, it finds it unoccupied, swept, put in order, and that's the right reason why I picked the Amplified, even decorated. So by all appearances, it looks like that life has things now perfectly ordered, arranged, set in place, so much so that it's even decorated. That said, because there's empty spaces, it's only going to lead to something worse. And I'm here to tell you today, empty spaces within our lives, within our hearts, within our relationships, in our whatever, you can fill in the blank left unattended, will lead to chaos, they'll lead to making poor choices, and ultimately will lead you to compromise God's best for your life. And you gotta take notice, why am I experiencing emptiness in this area of my life, in this, in this area, this segment within my heart? Why is there this gnawing emptiness? And why am I constantly looking away to be, to be distracted from that And God is saying, I want to attend to that. I want to fill that. I want to fix that. Because just to leave it alone, it's not going to go away. And eventually, it's going to go from bad to worse. So here's where I want to end up. I knew last Sunday, with it being the last Sunday of our 100-year celebration, even though I was broadcasting, we need to have some people help us for COC. I want you to be thinking about these two things. To be, full, to, to be stuffed full with God's goodness, it comes down to two things. The Bible talks about it, about being filled with God's spirit. So to be, full of, to be stuffed full with God's goodness, it relates to God's spirit. But number two, it relates to your service. Because this word goodness in Romans chapter 15, if you flip over to Galatians chapter five, when it begins to compare and contrast that antagonistic lifelong warfare battle that happens within all of our hearts between the lust of the flesh and the fruit of the Spirit. As you go through the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, one of the nine, there it is, is goodness. It's the same word that is found in Romans chapter 15. And sometimes we just stop at the most obvious definition that we think, well, yeah, the goodness, okay, I'm going to be a good guy. I'm going to be filled with God's goodness. Well, it it means being filled with God in the way that I talked about earlier, but it also means to be filled with good works. And you got to know, if you want to tackle some of the empty spaces that come calling, that come knocking on our heart's door and say, hey, I'm emptiness. I want to show up and I I want to sit in this particular chamber of your heart for the next four weeks. 
And next thing you know, you start having this emptiness about your relationship. You start having this emptiness about your life. You start having emptiness about your purpose. You start having this emptiness about all of these things and you lack, you lack, you lack, you lack. And you look away because you don't want to address it. You got to know that God's spirit is there. But you also got to know that there's something that we can do on our side and that is serve. Last week I mentioned this in passing. I just finished reading this book two weeks ago. Arnold, be useful. I have watched his uh, three-part documentary on Netflix, and it has to do with the different eras of his life and about how he was an athlete, then he was an actor, and then he became an activist, and he became the, the 38th governor of California, which, by the way, was no small feat. Did you know that California has the sixth largest economy in the world? In the world. There are more people in California than in all of Canada. Man, I mean, it's, it's, now, that's not true when it comes to land mass. I'm just saying. I'm just saying, just leave that alone. But Arnold, in, in writing, in, in that Netflix thing, he was talking about, I'm just completing the book, so I put it on my, this is going to go on my reading list, so I bought the book, read it. And what rocked me, and I shared this a few weeks ago on a Wednesday night, that Arnold on page uh, 248, and I sometimes, I do this, I'm crazy, but I'll write down when something speaks to me. So I wrote down that night at 12.16 a.m. It was the 10th day of the month of November at, uh, this year. I, I put a big star. You can see how I highlight it and stuff. But Arnold talks about how the science now backs up that if somebody is charitable in terms of their time, talents, and treasures, and they're volunteering and they're giving back, and Arnold's writing this about giving back and, and being helpful to people, how endorphins and oxycontins are released in our body, and they, came, they come from the very same pleasure center that other things that are, that are wonderful to experience in this life operate from and are administrated from. And he says here, he says, so... Pull that back. Social scientists have a name for this phenomenon. They call it the helper's high. That's how powerful giving back, that's how powerful giving back is. And you got to know that when we're asking you for your assistance, it's just not to benefit Pastor Todd and the crew that he needs to recruit. It's just not to benefit the people that are going to be there on the one of the 14 performances. It's just not going to benefit and put a smile on God's face. And all of those things are accurate and true. It's also going to benefit you. Because as you serve, the people you serve, they benefit, you benefit. You get the benefit of the helper's high. And so in the first service, I got I to update my stats. But in the first service for our third floor, Renee's responsibilities, which are in the lobby, we needed 70 slots filled there because there's 14 performances. You need five people a night. All 70 of those are filled. Done. Perfect. Okay? She's a sweet. Now, while you're clapping for her, I hope you clap just aloud for this. Tomorrow is her birthday. She turns 50. And the reason why I'm saying that is because she looks amazing and she's awesome as she hits the 50-mile mark. That said, I have to be out of town. It's, it's not, it's out of my control. And so I gotta, I'm gonna be away for a couple of days. Normally, uh, I would be here on her birthday. You can see all of our Christmas decorations starting to be pulled out. She's gonna be here tomorrow morning. We need a crew of people just to come and help. It's her birthday, man. I would be here. You might say, oh, you're skipping out. I would be here if I could be here. I can't be here. If you can see her after this service, but you will get the helper's high and you'll get a hug from me. How about that? A hug from me and the helper's high. But in the first service, I said that we needed, we had 100, for, the, for our third floor, we have 350 slots that we need filled. 25 people per night times 14 performances is 350. Before the first service, we had 169 spots filled and we needed 181 more. After the first service, 31 people or 31 slots were filled up. So now we need 151. So one person can represent anywhere between one 
and 14 of those slots. If they take every performance, if they just take one, all I'm asking, can you give us one? Can you give us two? The first, the first weekend of performances, I think we're really solid. I think we're, we're pretty good. But it's in the latter part of the second week that really we need some people. We, we need you. We want you. It's a great time. But this is a time that we can be stuffed full with God's goodness. We can be stuffed full because we can call on his name and experience the fullness and when the Bible talks about to be filled with the Holy Spirit, the, the, the present tense of that, uh, in, in Paul's letter in the Amplified, it says to be ever filled and stimulated by the Holy Spirit. So it's just not a one-time thing. It's a lifetime thing. So you can be filled by God's Spirit, but you're filled with God's goodness by your service. So go ahead and stand with me this morning. I'm going to dismiss you here in just a moment. I'm going to ask the prayer team if they'll be down here available for anyone who would like prayer. I know that, and I'm quite surprised, in a crowd this size, I was expecting a lot less. I need to raise my expectations. So thank you for your faithfulness. But if you're here today, and you might say, Todd, I, I relate to that when you talked about emptiness. I've got a wonderful life. I've got, I've got so many blessings, but in this area, in that area, it seems like I've got some empty space feels like sometimes I feel at a loss or I feel like I, I, there's a lack in that particular area. And I want you to know, God is not frustrated with you. God is not looking down on you. God is saying, I've got the remedy for you. I want to fill you full. I want to stuff you full with my goodness, by my spirit, and by your service. And we can experience both in our lives. Let's pray. I'm going to dismiss. And if you would like prayer about any of those things. Or maybe there's nothing that I preach today, but there's, there, there's a weight upon you and there's a heaviness upon you. That's why our prayer team is here, to pray with you, to agree with you, and to see those burdens lifted off of you. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, today I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you that we can say as your people, we know what it is to be stuffed full with your goodness. God, there are so many good things, so many great things, so many God things that, Lord, that you've poured and packed into our lives. That said, sometimes we still, there are little recesses, little corners. Lord, sometimes these, these little chambers within other chambers, Lord, that it's just an empty space. And I pray, God, uh, by your spirit and by us willing, our willingness to serve, I pray, God, that we would be stuffed full of your goodness. I pray today that no one would feel like I'm laying some guilt trip. Lord, I want your best for every person in here. And I know, Lord, one of the ways, it's not the only way, but one of the ways to experience different things and maybe even brand new things is just by serving. I know that to be true. And I pray today, Lord, I pray, Lord, that our list would be filled. And, Lord, that we would even have a waiting list, Lord, for people willing to serve. Say, listen, if, you need any, if anybody drops out, put my name on the list. I'm good. I'm there. And I pray, oh God, Lord, that we would see people come each night to those 14 performances. A few weeks ago, Pastor Brad on a Wednesday night was talking about long shots. And I pray, oh God, that that place would be filled with long shots, that mothers and fathers are praying about prodigal sons and daughters or prodigal grandsons and granddaughters or whoever it might be in that family tree, that close, that close friendship, whatever and whoever, Lord, that, that person is defined by. But Lord, on that night, Lord, as we are there praying and as we are there serving and the altar call is given, that hands and hearts would be extended towards heaven and lives would be turned around. That's our hope, I pray, Jesus, in your name. Amen.